it's a real pleasure to be at this illustrious meeting and to be able to uh, talk a little bit about uh, what we've been doing over the last years uh, in our explorations of RNA land. Uh, so in principle, so what I'll do in my talk is uh, I'll uh, sort of splitting that into uh, three parts. The first one uh, is a little bit waiting around in the intestines of our uh, read mapper, sort of trying to make the point that uh, there is something to uh, doing an agnostic as possible uh, read mapping step without putting any uh, biological preconceptions into uh, that step as far as possible. Uh, and then I will just uh, switch to a much more uh, biological uh, topic uh, and speak about uh, two of the monsters that uh, we have been working on in quite a bit of detail with experimentalist collaborators, in particular the lab of Daniel Teipser in Munich and the lab of Friedemann Huan in Leipzig uh, on two very different uh, long non-coding RNAs that are uh, turned out to be sort of weird. So the read mapping problem, it seems, is something that's sort of pretty much solved, right? It's a really simple problem anyway. All we have to do is map more or less short reads with not too many errors, hopefully, uh, to a reference genome. Um, and uh, what, we, what we want is we have sequenced our RNA, and what we want is we want to know where does it come from in the genome. So, so far, so easy. Uh, the technical problem is there is lots of fragments, so you don't want to do that by classic alignment algorithms, as we all know. Uh, but there's also a bunch of biological problems that make the whole thing a little bit harder than uh, we would like to think. Uh, first of all, there is plenty of mismatches and insertions and deletions uh, between the RNA sequencing uh, reads that we get uh, and the reference genome coming from lots of different sources, from polymorphism, from RNA editing, uh, from errors uh, of various uh, types, uh, including polymorphisms uh, in, the, in the reference genome. This is not that much of an issue if you think human data. This becomes very much of an issue if you think some lower uh, deuterous tomes where you have allelic variation that goes up to about eight or 10% uh, between haplotypes. Um, there is, of course, the whole issue of splicing. What do you do if uh, the read doesn't uh, map as a single interval? Uh, the simplest thing is to say, okay, let's just uh, take at least collinearity as a filter, but that has the preconception that uh, first of all, your genome is correctly assembled and it assumes that uh, your RNAs really are uh, collinear images uh, from the genome. So no circularization, no transplicing, uh, no weird things going on. Uh, and then we already heard yesterday a sales pitch for actually looking at repetitive material. What usually is done is throwing away everything that doesn't pretty much map uniquely to the genome uh, on the account that we don't exactly know where it comes from in the first place. Uh, and I'll show you in uh, the second part uh, of my talk that uh, this is not always a particularly brilliant idea. Uh, so I'll just uh, speak a little bit about our, uh, <coughs> uh, our in-house uh, tool which is out there for everybody to use, try out and play. Uh, which is called Segemail. Uh, the spelling uh, in its weird quasi-German form will show up on one of the next transparencies. It's, it's, uh, it's based on uh, enhanced suffix arrays uh, and um, these things are conceptually the same as suffix trees. So uh, you convert your genome into an index data structure that looks like a tree. Uh, and what you do is if you start with a tree, you start at the root and then stepwisely go through the tree and see uh, whether the whole thing uh, matches. If you, uh, if you match your whole read, you can basically see that you can go through the whole thing in a time for matching a single string that goes in linear time. So this is kind of nice. Um, 
the Sega made mapping algorithm uh, actually uh, is seed based uh, in a sense it doesn't try to map the, uh, the read just from the beginning it actually looks for the longest matches of all substrings of a query uh, and uh, it actually also uh, is designed to evaluate all the alternative matches so it actually by, by default unless you switch that option off uh, explicitly it actually tries to do multiple matches and keeps track of how many matches it finds and where they are obviously. Uh, for every match that it finds it realigns uh, the whole thing uh, with a dynamic programming algorithm at the end which is not a big hassle because essentially you've, with the seeds you've already found where you are in the genome uh, and uh, you can do that step quite efficiently. Sort of the key observation here is, and I'm not going through any details here, is that the longest match of all substrings of a query can be computed uh, in uh, linear time in the length of the query. Uh, and the trick to do that uh, is to use a matching function uh, that uses uh, internally an extra table, an extra enhancement of this enhanced suffix array called the suffix link table. Uh, which essentially uh, for every uh, interval in the, uh, in the suffix tree uh, gives you uh, the corresponding interval for the suffix that's one shorter. Uh, this allows you basically to uh, use that matching function in, uh, internally in uh, a kind of recursive way where you match your string really stepwisely uh, and uh, you can do each one of these steps in linear time so you get all the uh, substrate, the longest uh, matches of all the substrings uh, in total in uh, linear time uh, in the length of the query times the number of um, uh, times the number of hits that you actually have uh, for equally long uh, substrings and the uh, kind of uh, really neat uh, property of this matching function is that you can modify that now to already allow in your seats uh, additionally a, a, a fixed number of mismatches including insertions and deletions. Uh, the idea basically being that when you traverse with that matching function through your, uh, through your suffix array that at each branching point uh, you can actually branch out uh, into some of the uh, branches and uh, keep track of how many errors you've already allowed in that branch. You, br you prune by the number of uh, branches uh, and uh, in that way uh, you can actually already with your seats jump over uh, individual mismatches. Uh, what that allows you to do is basically you, it allows you to it basically guarantees you to find seats already uh, in sequence divergence is of about 10% or so uh, with uh, uh, not much of a loss in sensitivity. Uh, the, quest, the question of specificity is basically afterwards taken care of by uh, piecing the whole thing together uh, and aligning the whole read uh, uh, at the end with my speed vector algorithm for the blocks uh, that uh, you find. Um, I don't want to belabor the, uh, the benchmarks, basically I hate, ben I hate to read benchmark papers and find it very boring to take people through benchmark data, so the blue dot uh, is our tool Sega mail, it sort of always comes up in the corner where it's supposed to, uh, to be and I think that's all that I want to say, so the whole thing works, uh, it's reasonably nicely sensitive, the specificity is on par with everybody else. Uh, what you pay for the extra, sen well, for the extra sensitivity uh, on various data sets uh, is the thing is slower and it's a bit of a memory hawk but uh, for several applications uh, we find it worthwhile to expand an extra factor of two or three uh, in CPU time uh, for the improved quality of the matchings that we, uh, of the mappings that we get in particular if you do things like uh, map to uh, a reference genome that's not exactly the same strain uh, or something like that. Um, the whole thing becomes uh, much more interesting uh, if uh, you're actually thinking about 
uh, mapping data from uh, uh, complicated eukaryotic uh, transcriptomes where uh, they uh, uh, where the uh, where the issue basically is that uh, we have uh, splice sites, so we fi actually find reads uh, that map to distance uh, reference loci. Uh, it's actually very uh, easily doable uh, in practice. The number of seeds that we find, unless we hit something repetitive, uh, is actually fairly small, so that it's very easy to chain those guys. Uh, and uh, produce uh, alignments um, with a slight modification uh, of my speed vector algorithm. So again, very efficiently implementable. Uh, the whole idea basically is that now instead of sort of one uh, alignment matrix, you now have a stack of alignment matrices for all the low subway you found seeds, which is usually very few, usually only two or three or four, depending on how many splice junctions uh, you have in your read, uh, and uh, you can actually realign in essentially linear time uh, this uh, read uh, to the uh, to the locus, uh, uh, just finding out where the kind of punctures are where you have to jump from one locus uh, to the next. Um, uh, again, uh, some boring. Uh, performance slides, so the, the whole point is essentially that uh, the uh, tool Segemail is geared towards uh, working with all kinds of reads. It does old style 454 reads, it does very long Sanger reads. Uh, I don't have a slide here, but it also works reasonably well uh, even with PacBio reads. Uh, it does Illumina reads uh, as good as everybody else. Um, the, uh, the, the nice thing is it also works with very long 454 reads. You don't have to do anything fancy. It just finds all the splice junctions in them uh, all by itself. Uh, it operates on a kind of hierarchical model. If you can find something that's nicely collinear, use it. Uh, if, you can, if you can't find something that's nicely collinear, then try uh, to do alternative combinations uh, of matches so it doesn't actually fall into the trap of sort of more or less randomly giving you uh, the real gene or some stuff that's picked out from uh, various uh, pseudo genes or uh, recent publications or whatever. Um, we've actually built this thing in part with finding circular transcripts uh, and transplice tra uh, transcripts uh, in mind uh, and uh, where you get a lot of extra mileage out of the tool is in particular if you're looking for this kind of non-standard transcript organizations uh, in um, Illumina data sets. So uh, we used here rather short 100 uh, nucleotides. It also works uh, pretty much as good as, uh, as, good as everybody else, uh, sometimes a lot better. Uh, on large reads, um, again, uh, in precision, it's about as good as everybody else, uh, and we gain uh, quite a bit uh, in recall. Uh, what can you do with that thing? Uh, so one of the tests, since we are claiming we actually get some extra sensitivity uh, with, that, uh, with that machinery, is that something that's actually worthwhile doing? And uh, so one of the test examples that we did was uh, reevaluate uh, capture seek data from John Matic uh, from one of the uh, best studied uh, loci that are there, the P53 locus. And uh, what we found uh, just out of the box is uh, evidence for at least three uh, extra uh, isoforms that have not been described anywhere else, that were not in John's paper or anywhere else in the literature. Uh, and it actually turns out one can validate. Uh, those nicely by PCR, uh, in particular uh, fibroblast uh, cell lines, um, but not in a lot of other uh, tissues, in fact. So their expression is surprisingly uh, specific. Uh, this was done by our collaborators in Munich, so they have a big uh, panel of cell lines and they just tested out all the fibroblast-like things that they uh, had sitting around. 
Um, another test sort of for the, for the trans splicing uh, or the, the, the capability of using uh, SegaMail for trans splicing uh, was just to uh, redo an analysis of an old uh, nematode uh, data set um, uh, from Hila, uh, which is already five years old. Uh, as you probably know, nematodes uh, have uh, spliced leader transplicing, so most of their transcripts are actually uh, spliced together with a small non-coding RNA, the so-called spliced leader, uh, uh, which comes in nematodes uh, in a large number of slightly different genes. Uh, and uh, they, uh, the name of the game now was just take your transcriptome data as they are, uh, map them to the genome, and A, can you see all the transplicing events, uh, and can we even find out which uh, mRNA actually is due to which version or which variant of the spliced leader. And it actually turns out you can uh, pull that out directly uh, of the uh, of the mapping data, you don't have to do anything fancy in pre-processing or write anything for your transcriptome data. You just look at which uh, spliced leader gene uh, you hit uh, with a transplice junction to the rest of the of the transcript. So these were uh, links 100 Illumina data, as far as I recall. Uh, and what we got out uh, is essentially uh, the same uh, as the uh, as the authors of the of the original paper. Uh, found about 70% of the mRNAs have spliced leaders, which very nicely agrees with uh, their analysis. Uh, and uh, if we uh, look at uh, where the spliced leaders fall, uh, we get we pretty much exactly recapitulate uh, their data, which were done by uh, one by one, expecting uh, the five premiums uh, of these transcripts. Uh, so this is. Uh, just to show that the tool sort of works nicely for uh, lots of these in particular sort of more non-standard applications. Uh, just one sort of other weird example, this is the uh, mod MG4 uh, gene in Drosophila. This is one of the few loci where it's actually known that you get a transcript for some reason pieced together uh, from opposite <laughs> strands uh, at the same loci. So transcription starts here. Uh, and uh, you have an array of, uh, of exons uh, on, encoded on the opposite strand uh, and you get gene variants systematically that uh, transplice to this region. Mechanism unknown, uh, this locus otherwise is uh, fairly well characterized, so this is, uh, uh, this, is, this is very well validated that this is not data chunk but uh, an actual uh, real transcript. Uh, that uh, does something in chromatin modification uh, in Drosophila. Um, we've already heard a little bit about the functional importance of uh, circular transcripts, so it's a little bit of preaching to the choir here. Um, they act as microRNA sponges, uh, as published last year by Nikolaus Rajewski uh, and the Hansen group from Aarhus. Uh, they uh, may stabilize link RNAs against degradation, uh, which is unpublished uh, data also to show that for the Unreal isoforms. Uh, Unreal, which will be the topic uh, of the next part of my talk, uh, is a very complex non-coding RNA with a cillion of isoforms, many of which uh, are uh, actually circular uh, and um, um, uh, these uh, circular RNAs also play a role there. Um, Salzman and colleagues uh, estimated that uh, uh, circular RNAs are not super abundant, uh, but they actually are in volume something like 1% of the poly-8 transcript, so not exactly a negligible part uh, of the um, transcriptome either. Uh, and uh, it was reported uh, that there is a curious association of this um, circular transcript with ALUS, uh, so with a specific class of repetitive elements, which will also play a role in uh, my next 
uh, part of the talk and so just uh, as a little curiosity uh, what we were actually looking at uh, was the uh, circle and chimeric transcripts uh, in uh, the transcriptome uh, of Latimeria minatoensis, the silicant, uh, and uh, we actually analyzed sort of a portfolio of vertebrate uh, genomes and we found rather consistently that you can find a largish part uh, of uh, circular transcripts. Uh, if you look into these transcripts, and I don't want to belabor that, uh, clearly part of that are just PCR artifacts, uh, but there is also a large subset that looks real in the sense that it actually uses canonically splice junctions or uh, for, uh, the, uh, uh, for the junctions between uh, either the circularization uh, or uh, the combination uh, of uh, fragments that come even from different chromosomes. Uh, and uh, the really interesting part about that is that um, a large part of the splice junctions that are used for these transplicing or circularization events are actually, trans are actually splice junctions that are not regularly used uh, for producing proper um, uh, transcripts. Uh, whether that means something biologically, I don't know. Uh, it does certainly look like it's there biochemically. Uh, and anyway, I find it interesting that uh, whatever the machinery is doing there, whether that's an error or whether that's something that's done on purpose, uh, it seems to be using uh, splice sites that are different from the ones that are used in normal collinear um, uh, transcripts. Anyway, uh, so let me uh, switch to uh, the first uh, kind of monster uh, that we've uh, been playing around with. Uh, this is the chromosome 9 P21. Uh, locus uh, of fame from early uh, uh, genome-wide association studies. Uh, it was actually found as the single most significant uh, QTL for coronary heart diseases uh, and it was noticed fairly quickly that uh, if you look at the haplotype blocks that uh, are associated uh, with the uh, with those QTLs, uh, there is nothing that uh, looks in any way, shape or form coding in that region. Uh, and uh, what was described there uh, is a bunch of uh, transcripts with lots and lots and lots of exons, something like 30 uh, meanwhile, uh, and uh, so about uh, 20 uh, that uh, come up regularly uh, and there is a number of uh, fairly strong association signals for uh, all sorts of different things from diabetes and stroke, uh, various cancers, uh, leukemia uh, and of course the coronary heart disease uh, um, and uh, arthritis and basically everything comes up in one uh, shape or form uh, on these locus. Um, the transcript that comes off that uh, was named Unreal uh, already many years ago. Uh, several labs, uh, including Howard Chung's, uh, worked in quite some detail uh, on these locus, uh, and it is certainly uh, one of these transcripts that uh, carries around uh, the polycom uh, complex. Uh, it's also known uh, to a certain extent that uh, it's somehow uh, integrated into the STAT pathway. Uh, STAT1 is one of the transcription factors that's known to have an effect uh, on this locus. Uh, and it's also known that it does quite a bit insist uh, on uh, chromatin modification. And uh, it has been strongly suspected from uh, various uh, data that uh, it has an effect uh, on distant loci. Um, so what our collaborators uh, in Munich, the group of uh, Daniel Teibsen, Leska Hort, 
started to do was uh, trying to tease apart uh, the various isoforms uh, and overexpress specific uh, isoforms uh, and uh, look at uh, the effect of gene expression uh, and uh, what you can see quite nicely. So this is four different constructs that we looked at in some more uh, different in, in some more detail. Uh, what you actually do find, okay, the whole thing does have uh, a sort of organized effect, but the size of the effect, uh, effect uh, the, 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 the amount of differential gene regulation that you get uh, uh, actually uh, seems to depend uh, quite a bit uh, on the actual isoform uh, uh, that you're using. Uh, so we started to get interested in what, what is it about the individual isoforms uh, that are used here and the issue here is that uh, if you look at these at these isoforms they're actually very different so uh, they mostly share the first exon there is also alternative promoters in there but I'm not going into that uh, but otherwise there is a very different uh, portfolio uh, of exons that are included or excluded uh, and there is very different uh, uh, stops uh, in this uh, transcript. Um, so uh, what we also uh, found uh, very quickly uh, is that overexpression of these isoforms actually has uh, a lot of uh, different uh, cellular phenotypes. Uh, in particular, this isoform 4 uh, has an increased uh, 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 cell adhesion. It's just more sticky. Um, uh, you can, uh, uh, this uh, viability uh, of, this, of the cells uh, uh, differs uh, and so on and so forth. So there's, there's, there's plenty of cellular phenotypes that are affected by just overexpressing uh, individual ones uh, of these isoforms. Um, if you look at uh, uh, what is actually uh, bound uh, to this, uh, uh, to this Unreal transcript, uh, we can uh, quite nicely find that, uh, yes, it really sticks to post the PRC1 and the PRC2 complex. It doesn't bind to REST or to some other stuff. Uh, and uh, <coughs> there is a large uh, amount uh, of genes that uh, are repressed by Unreal. There's another uh, large part that's induced by Unreal and you can do all the usual complementation experiments and so on and so forth. So uh, if you destroy these transcripts, you can rescue them uh, by putting in the, uh, uh, the, the transcript in trans and so on and so forth. So um, this sort of all uh, makes sense to really show that uh, Unreal is acting in trans and is doing something. Um, we also uh, looked at uh, the regions around the promoters of the genes that were differentially expressed. Uh, if you look at the downstream and at the upstream, uh, at the down and at the upregulated uh, genes, or if you throw them together, your uh, main will basically give you these motifs, uh, which actually look surprisingly large and surprisingly well-defined. Uh, so it's actually uh, a kind of natural to just take this long sequence and blast it. Uh, and what you get when, the, when you do that is you drown in hits because this thing uh, is actually uh, an allo element. Um, if we look at, uh, uh, we also looked at that uh, with Chipsec, with uh, Suits 12 and CBX7. Uh, and uh, the interesting part is so if we uh, if we just uh, use a unique uh, mapping uh, of our reads, essentially you get a very, very tiny, essentially non-existing signal. I and mean, look at the uh, uh, look at the uh, uh, at the coverage values here. Only if we switch on multiple mapping of our reads, uh, we actually get a very strong uh, signal uh, of the mapped uh, peaks uh, to uh, the genome, and the reason is that uh, with this motif, we are actually hitting 
uh, an alloy element sitting in the promoters and this is exactly what you, uh, what you get uh, uh, out of this, uh, of this data. And the interesting part is if you look back to the Unreal uh, uh, to, the, to, the, to the Unreal transcript, in this case uh, the Unreal 4 transcript, uh, you actually find uh, the motif itself, uh, a very nice copy uh, of the same type of slightly degraded alu uh, in the Unreal transcript itself. So the, the suspicion was uh, it is actually this alu element uh, that is important for the binding uh, or for the targeting uh, and uh, what it finds somehow uh, is these alloy elements uh, in the uh, promoters uh, and uh, so we can actually test that specifically by using isoforms where uh, we include or exclude uh, this alloy element uh, from, uh, the, uh, from the isoform if, and it turns out that if we use isoforms uh, that um, uh, that have the alloy element included, uh, then they actually have a strong effect on gene expression. If we exclude this alloy element, uh, the uh, effect is smaller or essentially non-existent depending on uh, the target gene. Uh, this also correlates with uh, a bunch of other uh, phenotypic features. Um, uh, again, uh, uh, the stickiness of the cells uh, resistance uh, against apoptosis uh, depends on uh, which one of the isoforms you, uh, you're using uh, and whether you actually have this allo element uh, included or not. Uh, to nail that down a little bit further, instead of just uh, using another isoform, uh, 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 Daniel and Leska uh, uh, built four constructs where they mutated out of that alloy element uh, a quarter, a third, or every single nucleotide uh, and built that uh, synthetic, uh, overexpressed that synthetic construct. Uh, and what you actually find is you find a nice trend uh, of uh, activity in uh, various uh, 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 physiological parameters uh, that correlate with the number of. Uh, deletions or with the number of errors I should say with the number of substitutions that you build in there so that uh, is pretty strong evidence that the RO element indeed is important for uh, the targeting uh, and the function uh, of uh, this RNA. Uh, it actually turns out you can even go back uh, to uh, the clinic uh, and find uh, that uh, depending on uh, whether you have a haplotype that uh, expresses uh, this, uh, uh, this, this isoform uh, at, the, at higher levels, the one that, that uh, actually contains the alu, uh, you actually also uh, find in clinical samples a difference uh, between essentially stickiness and lifetime. Uh, of these cells. So this measures basically the stickiness of the cells and this uh, here uh, measures uh, the uh, apoptosis. Uh, so the model that we are thinking about is that uh, actually this alu element uh, indeed is directly involved uh, in uh, the RNA uh, in the interaction in the targeting uh, and it's tempting to speculate that what we're seeing here is actually a direct interaction uh, between RNA and DNA, although we don't have a proof for that. Could also be that there is some weird protein complex in between that recognizes alus uh, on both sides, which is don't know yet. Um, since we heard a lot about uh, conservation, and I apologize for this weird uh, uh, conversion error uh, in, in my, from my postscript file. I don't know why it, uh, the postscript, uh, the PDF converter decided to leave out some of the letters here. Uh, the lettering is not particularly interesting. Uh, uh, this is the CDN uh, K2BA uh, 
P2 uh, gene here, that's a protein coding gene. What you see here is all the individual exons of Unreal, include, uh, in, so the individual splice junctions, I, sh I should say, of, uh, that have been reported for Unreal. Uh, everything that's dark green uh, is nicely conserved in other species. We start here with human, go down to uh, the, um, uh, the primates, uh, and then go into mouse and uh, sort of all the way down to uh, lower vertebrates. Uh, what you nicely can see is the conservation of this protein coding gene here, which is much stronger. Some uh, of the splice junctions uh, of Unreal uh, actually can be traced pretty much to the root of the vertebrates. So this is uh, this row where you essentially the signal stops is monodelphis. Uh, so uh, this is just going to say that uh, Unreal actually is a transcript uh, or is a locus that has been around uh, since the uh, uh, since the, the, the divergence of the placental mammals at least, uh, maybe a little bit longer. But what we can also see from uh, most uh, of uh, the parts of the, of the gene, so most of the splice junctions uh, that we see in the human Unreal transcripts uh, is actually not there. Uh, and uh, while Unreal uh, is such a focus uh, of QTLs in human, and it, there is actually also mouse QTLs that, uh, that fall there, an experiment of deleting the entire locus from the mouse uh, <laughs> leaves a viable mouse that at least in the lab seems to be pretty happy. Uh, so whatever that thing is, it doesn't apparently kill you, uh, but it might make you unhappy over longer times uh, if something is wrong with that Unreal locus. So it, uh, the, uh, the association signal is fairly strong and the, the risk factors that come with uh, the risk alleles in Unreal are actually fairly large there. A uh, factor of two or three or so for uh, EQTLs uh, with four particular isoforms. So uh, it's not so much an effect of the uh, of the genetics in there, uh, the uh, but there's fairly dramatic uh, effects uh, depending on isoform uh, expression here, uh, which I guess is also an interesting lesson that you have here in RNA, where it's not the entire locus. Uh, but the, um, uh, uh, but the, um, uh, the individual isoforms. Uh, so very quickly, uh, my last little monster, uh, this actually showed up in uh, old tiling array data uh, that we performed for looking on uh, uh, systematically uh, association of long non-coding RNAs uh, with particular signaling pathways uh, is a uh, stimulation by STAT3 uh, or the cell cycle. Uh, and what you see here is cells uh, which were deprived uh, of IL-6, so this shuts down uh, uh, STAT3 uh, and then uh, when, you shut, when you switch on IL-3 again you uh, find several loci where you get these huge waves uh, of transcription uh, over hundreds uh, of kilobases, uh, and there's actually a bunch of these things uh, that sort of look like unprocessed uh, primary transcripts. Uh, they've also uh, uh, been found by Filip Kapranov uh, in several cancer cell lines. Uh, they're actually long enough that uh, you can identify their reading direction uh, just from uh, a, a sort of a small decline uh, in the actual expression level uh, over the locus. So it really seems like what you're observing here is uh, a sort of dynamic equilibrium between production uh, and uh, deletion or, or, or degradation uh, of these RNAs. They are largely unspliced. There is a few splice junctions in there, but they seem to be spliced rather inefficiently. Uh, and what they do is some of them are fairly ubiquitously uh, expressed like this stair 18. Others are extremely specific to certain cell lines, uh, so they are at least uh, possibly useful as biomarkers. And I'll just spend one last minute uh, on STAIR-18, uh, for which uh, uh, in the lab of Friedemann and Horn, uh, we performed CHIRP. Uh, we found that uh, it has a bunch of uh, targets like MLL5, a 3-thorax gene, and some weird ones uh, come up very 
uh, strong like uh, uh, this wash 2 p uh, pseudogene and anonymous locus on chromosome 9 and a bunch of other things. Uh, if we look at RNA that uh, associates with this complex, we find lamin uh, and a number of other uh, pre-mRNAs, in particular the pre-mRNA of STAT3. Uh, what we also know for, uh, uh, for, um, uh, uh, for STAR18 is that it actually has a STAT3 dependent promoter uh, and uh, a, a knockdown uh, of STAT3 uh, actually reduces the uh, STAT3 protein levels in, in the six cells. Um, so uh, what, we, uh, what we find, uh, and I don't uh, have the latest uh, data to confirm all that, but the data are in, there is a nice positive feedback loop uh, between this uh, slightly monstrous uh, uh, STAR18 transcript uh, and the start 3 mRNA, uh, which is the transcription factor that expresses it. Uh, and it actually does uh, also have uh, several cellular phenotypes uh, if you overexpress uh, or if you uh, knock down or knock out this gene. Um, so, Conclusions, agnostic mapping of multiple matches is a good idea because otherwise we wouldn't have found uh, the uh, ALU in Unreal uh, and we would also not have found a lot of the, the target genes uh, in the case of STAR18. Uh, we segmented just by way of advertisement that works nicely in practice. Uh, long non coding RNA function can be very specific to particular isoforms and to particular things that are included or excluded. Uh, repetitive elements uh, actually do play, uh, seem to play a major role in the uh, function of at least some long non coding RNA. Uh, and uh, this very brief glimpse at STAR18, which is all unpublished data, is yet. Uh, show that uh, these poorly spliced monstrosities uh, actually can have uh, quite a bit uh, of function. Uh, and with that, I'm almost in time and at the end of my presentation. And I would in particular like to thank our experimentalist collaborators, uh, Daniel Types and Leska Holt in Munich, uh, Chris Amemia, who was in on the Latimeria project, uh, and I should single out Steve Hoffman, uh, who was in the strange, uh, he's a medical doctor uh, and uh, uh, was already running his independent uh, research group uh, on transcriptomics at the medical school in Leipzig while at the same time getting a PhD uh, in bioinformatics with me. Uh, so thank you for your attention. So Unreal contains the ALU element, but then you also mentioned that Unreal is conserved in placental mammals. So I'm wondering then, what is the repeat element that you see in the other mammals? I haven't looked at that systematically, I have to say. So I don't know if Unreal function, or at least the functions that we, that we see here, or its target chains are conserved in, in any other mammals. So there's no data on that yet. So following up on <coughs> that same, same line, um, is this actually predictive? So, I mean, allo elements are very frequent, obviously. So, would you see that more or less all the, the possible targets that are, for instance, an accessible chromatin are now bound uh, by ANRIL, or does that only explain parts of the, the data? The it the seems to explain only, only parts. There is also something about the relative organization of the, uh, of the, of the, the SUITS-12, the CBX-7, uh, uh, binding site and the relative location uh, of the uh, of the of the unreal uh, so of the of that alu element uh, and there actually seems to be that the relative spatial organization of that uh, actually also seems to have an effect on whether you see an up or a down regulation but these data are sort of uh, not not hard enough to <laughs> uh, make a big point out of Maybe I missed something about this, but if the function is related to the ALU element itself, why do you actually see such a strong EQTL only on this ALU and not all the other ALUs? So the, 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 uh, uh, the, the EQTL uh, you, you actually see on 
particular isoforms in that in that Unreal transcript, and there is essentially just one that's included in the in the exons. Well, there is a second one that's sort of split between two different exons, but those are isoforms that are very rare, at least in the cell lines that we've looked at. And they don't get produced by other authors. Hmm? And these other isoforms, those particular exons, don't get produced by other algorithms, or from other algorithms. No, no, so the, the Unreal transcript actually is a, is a fairly long transcript with lots and lots and lots of, uh, of, of exons. So there's five, six exons that you need to make the whole thing from this particular locus. And there is just one ALU element that gets, that gets included there. And the, the SNP, uh, uh, so the, uh, uh, the, the, the genetic variation is, is not in that ALU element. It's, uh, it's somewhere else in that locus. And what it does is, by mechanisms unknown, uh, uh, influence the relative expression levels uh, uh, probably by some somehow uh, having something to do with little changes in the chromatin that exp that changes splicing or I don't know so whatever the mechanism there is the uh, uh, the polymorphisms essentially uh, uh, change the relative expression of isoforms it seems uh, and then it's the particular isoforms or their relative mix uh, that actually uh, makes the phenotype. 